The Pirate Bay is most certainly one of the world's most infamous websites. Since its founding in 2003, the Pirate Bay has been one of the most popular sites for downloading movies, software and games. As you can expect, this has outraged copyright holders and prosecutors who have been attempting to shut down the site and prosecute the pirates. But no matter how many times they take it down, it always appears to be a matter of time until the site is back up and operating. Given this, you believe that the key to resolving the problem is to address the core cause by removing the founders. However, prosecutors have also attempted this as well. They've hunted the founders around the world, imprisoned them, and accused them with every copyright infringement accusation imaginable. Nonetheless, the Pirate Bay continues to exist. In fact, one of the founders was willing to serve jail time in order to keep the Pirate Bay running. So, here's how the Pirate Bay came to be, what happened to its creators, and why prosecutors have been unable to shut it down. Looking back, the Pirate Bay's origins may be traced back to a Swedish group named Pirate Brian, which translates as the Piracy Bureau. The organization, as the name implies, worked to legalize piracy through political ties, petitioning and lobbying. The majority of people in the organization believed that information should be freely distributed. They questioned the concept of intellectual property all over the internet. In fact, some would argue that piracy benefits businesses by getting expensive software and games into the hands of consumers who would not have tried them otherwise. And once people become addicted to a game or software, they are considerably more inclined to purchase it a second time or third time. I would never claim that piracy is moral, but there's no denying that without piracy, softwares like Windows, Adobe's Creative Cloud, and even Grand Theft Auto wouldn't be nearly as popular as they are now. This line of reasoning was basically the framework of Pirate Brian, and in September of 2003, they would decide to take it to the next level. Three Pirate Brian employees named Peter Sonde, Gofrid Schwatom, and Frederick Nietzsche launched a file sharing site called the Pirate Bay. The concept was inspired by BitTorrent, which launched a few years prior. The Pirate Bay was originally hosted on servers in Mexico. Gofford persuaded his employer, who owned servers in Mexico, to assist him in running the site, but it didn't take long for his boss to back down. As a result, the founders were compelled to bring the site back home, where Gofford ran it on his Pentium 3 laptop with 256 megabytes of RAM. Despite the simple design, considering the restricted number of file sharing sites available in 2003, pirates started to flood in. By the end of 2004, the Pirate Bay had 1 million users and exchanged 60,000 files. As the site grew in popularity, the three extended their operations by acquiring servers and databases and they transformed their laptop servers into an international file sharing hub. By 2006, the site was hosting everything under the sun, from music and movies to software and games. To make matters worse, Pirate Bay made no attempt to separate itself from these operations. Other prominent piracy sites such as Mega.NZ attempted to present a good guy reputation in order to avoid legal issues. However, this was not the case with Pirate Bay. These guys were happy to promote unrestricted information sharing across the internet and they had no intention of concealing themselves behind a fictitious persona. And this attitude became clear to authorities after they issued dozens of copyright infringement and stop and desist notices that were ignored by the founders. For several years, the police tried to ignore the new website, but as it grew to gain popularity, they began to get increasing pressure to take it down. They ultimately made the decision to crack down in 2006. Given the nature of what they were pursuing, I'm sure the founders always anticipated conflict with the law. They might not have anticipated the prosecutor's retaliation though. On May 31st, 2006, 65 policemen conducted a data center raid and shut down the servers for Pirate Bay. It was made quite plain that the site should not be resurrected, although none of the creators were detained. But as you might expect, the founders disregarded these restrictions. Within just three days, Pirate Bay came back online after they moved to new servers in an undisclosed part of the Netherlands. The raid not only failed to shut down the website, it also encouraged more people to use it. You see, the police raid made headlines throughout the world and even the New York Times covered it. These news stories not only increased the website traffic but also sparked a global movement of internet nerds. Polisen.se, the official website of the Swedish police, was taken down by a hacker who broke in. And the moment the government website went down, the police website went back online. 
These actions were obviously irresponsible but they undoubtedly made a statement. The Pirate Bay quickly rose to the 465th most popular website in the world following the raid and some lawyers even sided with the founders. They said that rather than upholding law and order, the Swedish government had caved in to American political pressure. Obviously, the government strongly denied these accusations and the lawsuits didn't really go anywhere. The government, however, had difficulty managing all of this unexpectedly bad PR. They initially thought that they would be celebrated as the heroes battling piracy, but they were painted as the villains. The truth is that most people have, at some point in their lives, used pirated software or media. Statistically, even though 59% of users are aware that downloading and streaming pirated content is against the law, 52% of online users have watched pirated videos, and those are just the ones who came clean. Because of this, it was unlikely that the average person was jumping up and down in excitement when it was announced that Pirate Bay had been shut down. Oh well, it was lovely while it lasted was probably the more realistic response. In light of this, very few people made an effort to support the Swedish government's efforts. Furthermore, without widespread public support, the government would be unable to simply raid the Pirate Bay once more because doing so would just strengthen its popularity. So, they decided to address the roots by taking down the founders. On April 17, 2009, the three founders Peter, Frederick and Gofrid, as well as the server provider Carl Landstrom were found guilty of copyright infringement and sentenced to one year in prison. In addition, they were forced to pay a fine of 30 million Swedish kroner which is worth 4.3 million dollars. The squad filed an appeal claiming that Sweden gave in to political pressure. This reduced their sentences by a few months but increased the fine to 46 million kroner which is equivalent to 6.6 .6 million US dollars. This didn't bother the founders because they had no intention of paying the fine. Peter really held up a sign during the press conference that followed the judgement which proclaimed I owe you 31 million kroner. He followed this up by implying that this was all the government was going to get. He stated that he didn't have any money and even if he did, he would rather bend everything and not even give them the ashes. Carl and Peter didn't fight the arrest much longer before surrendering, but the same could not be said for Gofrid and Frederick who fled. Gofrid fled to Cambodia where there was no extradition policy to Sweden. Despite the policy, Cambodian authorities detained Gofrid and extradited him to Sweden on August 30th, 2012. Some speculate that Sweden and Cambodia had an inside deal to extradite him. The Swedish government approved a 400 million kroner grant for Cambodia just six days after Gofrid was imprisoned. So far, so suspicious, but all we can do is speculate. Gofrid returned to Sweden and spent his prison sentence at the Marifred prison, but the police did not stop that. They also tacked on hacking and fraud charges, resulting in a three-year sentence. Gofrid was eventually released in September of 2015. Finally, Frederick was able to evade the cops for even longer than Gofrid. He had to fled Laos, Thailand and establish a life in both countries. To be honest, I'm not sure why he didn't just select one or the other, given that his dual life required him to cross the border on a frequent basis, and he was detained and deported at one of these border crossings in November of 2014. Fortunately for Frederick, his punishment was significantly less severe than Gofrid's, lasting only 10 months. Frederick claims that his time in prison wasn't all that awful and that it was worth it for Pirate Bay. He appears to be the only person in prison for a virtual crime. As a result, the guards were less harsh on him. He claims he was able to bring in USB sticks containing movies and watch them on his jail TV. He missed his friends and family but he says dozens of letters from Pirate Bay followers helped him to get through the 10 months. With all of the founders in custody, the police believed they could finally shut down Pirate Bay once and for all. On December the 9th, 2014, Swedish authorities raided the Pirate Bay once more, seizing all of their servers, laptops and equipment. With the founders gone, this must be the end, right? Just four days after the Pirate Bay was shut down, a touring site named Isohunt started a website called oldpiratebay.org that mirrored all of Pirate Bay's content. And it was at this point that the prosecutors recognized they had lost the game for good. Pirate Bay, on the other hand, does not really host any files. They just use links to connect peers from all around the world, so Pirate Bay is only storing links. The entire website's content can be kept in a gigabyte or less, and thousands of people make copies of the website on a daily basis. 
So even if authorities take down one copy of the site, uploading the gigabytes of data to a new server and registering a new name is not difficult. That is why it's impossible to completely shut down Pirate Bay. Considering this, authorities have essentially given up on shutting down Pirate Bay because there is no single person to hold accountable. Meanwhile, copyright holders have moved their efforts to collaborating with internet service providers to cut off internet access to pirates. However, this has just resulted in pirates utilizing VPNs. Anyway, as for the founders today, Peter went ahead and launched Flutter, a patron style service. Instead of paying to creators, the service is used to donate to websites and projects that improve society and expose corruption, such as WikiLeaks. Aside from Flutter, Peter has made countless talks and interviews about his varied worldviews. Gofford and Frederick, on the other hand, do not have as prominent a public image. In reality, they have no public presence and have vanished into the depths of the internet. After being released, Frederick stated that he intended to work in IT and reside in Laos. So that's probably what he's doing right now. That is what happened to the Pirate Bay founders and it is why Pirate Bay will never be shut down. Do you believe piracy is ethical? Tell us what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you've ever downloaded something you shouldn't have, leave a like and consider subscribing to see more videos.